I would like to, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all participants and speakers to the Miren online conference organized by PBL and TNO. The aim of this conference is to exchange knowledge on the Dutch energy transition industry. And this goes in line with the aim of the Miren project that was initiated by TNO and PBL. Originally, we had organized a hybrid conference but uh, with physical attendance, but given the current uh, COVID uh, situation, uh, we, uh, we decided to switch it, to switch it online. And, um, and if possible, we will still organize a conference next year uh, physically, because we value the networking as a way to uh, create connections and boost a knowledge exchange. Um, you can see the program here in the screen. I will start shortly with an introduction to the mid end project. I will share some details about the project and uh, its progress over the years and the next plans. Um, then uh, I will give the word to uh, the two keynote speakers, starting with Hertje and Langhorst, uh, chairman of Fame Bay, and uh, then followed by Ernst Morel, professor of Utrecht University to share their perspectives and challenges that the industry transition is facing. Afterwards, we will start with the sessions and we'll start with Marit van Hout from PVL. Um, she will share insights on modeling industry in the climate and energy outlook of 2021. We'll be followed by a short break and then we'll be followed by the presentation from Hattie Bowman from TNO discussing um, how uh, the colonization may affect the competitiveness of the Dutch chemical sector. And we will finalize these presentations with Corian Brink from PVL about the Netherlands Feed for 55 policy package. Um, then we will finalize with a plenary discussion moderated by Wouter Wetzels. And then we'll lead to the closure of the presentation. Um, there will be room for questions after each talk. So we ask you to please write down your questions in the chat, because given the amount of participants present and limited time, we will not take uh, questions directly. Only the questions are placed in the chat. So please, as well, we ask you to mute your microphones. Note that this conference will be recorded and uh, slides and recorded will be sent out to, to the participants and also placed at the meeting site afterwards. I will now like to start with the introduction of the MIDEN project. MIDEN refers to a manufacturing industry decarbonization data exchange network, which is aimed at building a knowledge base for decarbonization options and is shared and recognized by all stakeholders. Uh, this knowledge base is made available to all stakeholders in the industry transition, um, in which science, market, and policy may have access and, and make use of to make uh, to make decisions. Um, it is tailored to, to the Dutch industry and, and in the scope we focus on the manufacturing industry under the Dutch EU ETS and uh, with data collected at the site level. It is a joint initiative by PBL and TNO already since 2018 and it started after uh, knowledge gaps identified after consultations in industry on the possibilities for decarbonization. It is also generated in collaboration with the companies and it mostly contains information on the current energy and material consumption of the manufacturing industry in the Netherlands and the options for decarbonization of its processes and the conditions to implement this uh, decarbonization options, such as the investment and operational costs, infrastructure, energy use, emission reduction. Um, the I, the Miden site, this uh, the knowledge base can be uh, accessible in the Miden site. It's midenweb.nl. Um, the purpose of Miden is to build this knowledge base for the future decarbonization options and provide a platform for industry knowledge exchange. So its stakeholders recognize and make use of Miden data and reports. Be um, can be used to support policy making on CO2 re reduction. Um, or um, as well uh, on the scenario studies, abatement studies, and supports industry, policymakers, and analysts 
on their efforts for, uh, to support, to achieve deep decarbonization. It's a trustworthy overview uh, that we have created over the past years and can be used to, uh, for studying transition paths and giving insights as well in the economic perspective, but also on opportunities for clean technologies, to, uh, clean technologies to the industry. And um, we know that cooperation between parties is needed, and the energy transition benefits for this transparent, up-to-date, and comprehensive public information. So I mentioned the scope of meeting is the industry manufacturing companies and their EU ETS in the Netherlands, um, from all the, the, the Dutch EU ETS companies, we exclude the five-year emissions average uh, of less than 10 kilotons per year, the companies with this, uh, that have these emissions, and we exclude electricity produ producers and the public sector. So then we cover about 65% of EU ETS in 2020. This is about 48 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So 246 companies in the scope of MIDEN. Um, this is the MIDEN framework in the decarbonization options categories until uh, about 2050, where we have fuel and feed substitution since um, power to, to gas or um, green or blue hydrogen. And we also look into process and product design, such as energy efficiency or process and product substitution. We look into recycling, the use of waste energy, the CO2 capture and storage or reuse. For all these options, we look into the conditions for their implementations, there are the costs, the, the DRL level, technology readiness level, and um, infrastructure and energy use. Um, as I mentioned, the Medium project started back in 2018 with research by TNO and PBL, together with Medium interns in collaboration with universities. Well, these Medium master, well, the master students were uh, assigned a company sector, a company or sector to um, to collect the data and guided by an expert at TNO and PBL. And we started the publications in 20, 2019 and. Uh, currently, we are finalizing the initial goals of the uh, report and all of the companies and sectors that we wanted to focus initially under the scope. And we have published um, three versions of the database. Uh, the last version was published last week. Um, and now in the coming month, we will continue finalizing the reports and the and improving the database and looking more into maintenance and improvement. Up to now, 37 industry sector reports have been published, 28 reports since November 2019, and five additional reports are expected soon. These are Dow Chemical, the asphalt industry, waste incineration, onshore natural gas, and bottle cluster. The last three, we have interns that are currently working on these studies, and they will be available in the coming months. For the database, I mentioned that since last week, we are happy to announce that it was uh, we, we published a new version last week with significant improvements. If you seen um, almost half, uh, we have covered almost half of the Dutch EU ETS industry emissions under scope this year. So uh, significant improvement have been done and 22 companies are still in progress to be added to the next, next database but most of the emissions have been covered already. Um, we're also happy to announce that uh, the TNO and PBL have expressed their intention to keep meeting knowledge available and updated until at least 2025. And uh, we, we aim, aim to do this as well um, by updating data, either by own initiative or by request from the meeting users, from you. Um, we also plan to extend the knowledge base, and um, we also want to keep the media network uh, active through uh, regular sounding board meetings and uh, events such as this one, conferences or the newsletter. But we also, in order to remain active, we also would like to receive your feedback and see what opportunities of improvement uh, we have in, in Miran. So please, uh, well, you can access all Miran reports and database at the Miran site, MiranWeb.nl, and we ask you to please share your feedback with us. 
Um, MIDEN is widely uh, supported by universities, branch organizations and the government. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank them for their co collaboration in the MIDEN project. Now I'd like to give the word to the, keynote, the first keynote speaker, Herjan Langskorst. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and I hope that I can be in visible. I'm standing with my feet in the water of the Hofvijver, but um, for, for the rest, it's uh, dry here, so that's okay. It's, um, well, a bit to get uh, acquainted to climate change, I think. Um, thank you for inviting me here this afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, chairman of VEMWE, that's the Vereniging Energie, Milieu en Water. We are an interest group and the knowledge center for non-residential energy and water consumers. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to say some words on the Midden project. Um, maybe I will say more about what should be done with the results of the Midden project than about the project itself. But um, I'm very happy um, with all the results that I've seen so far. And I, well, let me start with my, uh, my first slide. Um, we are talking about, oh, I have to, of course, pull the switch myself. Um, this is, I think, um, a nice picture of the industry that we have in the Netherlands. On the left, you see that we have 12 companies that um, are responsible for some 75% of CO2 emissions of the industry. Then we have some 300 companies that are um, uh, under the ETS scheme. And we have a thousand companies furthermore that have been uh, engaged in um, the MEA, the, the, the covenant on um, energy savings uh, that was applicable for the past years. Then there are still more companies that have to provide an annual energy audit. And then another 90,000 smaller companies have reporting obligations. So um, a lot of companies and they all have um, uh, an interest in what happens here in the Midden project, although I think that the project focuses on the top of this pyramid. Mostly the, the, the top 300 companies are in, as um, we just heard. Um, industry in the Netherlands is um, clustered in uh, five huge clusters. The biggest is Rotterdam uh, and Moerdijk, uh, but we also have clusters in the south, the north, and the west and the southwest of the country. And then, apart from the, those clusters, there's a lot of industrial companies um, in the rest of the country. Well, that about um, the background. Now about Midden, the Midden project. Um, well, uh, I think I saw Ton van Drill just uh, now. In uh, he's in the in the uh, in the uh, session, and uh, he was one of the people who made this project possible. I think it was a very important and timely initiative um, to create this common database, a knowledge database. The network that's working on this project is impressive, and um, it, it is really a textbook example of good cooperation between researchers and industry. We've seen an impressive number of studies so far. Many sectors are covered. And um, you see also see that it becomes more difficult when you come in the, con in the highly concentrated sectors where there are just a few companies like in steel or the refineries or the, re the fertilizers, just two companies. Then it is, of course, um, more difficult to make uh, an anonymized report on what happens in this sector because everyone can immediately see on which com of, about which companies we are talking. But um, still there um, very good and impressive uh, number of studies it provides an important database um, which is a useful source for modeling uh, for calibrating and and uh, calculating instruments like uh, the sda plus plus the levies um, and it has also helped to to um, increase the cooperation which gives all parties more trust in each other and in the system and all these results are, uh, are, are great. Um, but I think that um, Midden is uh, the start. Midden provides the bricks with which we can build nice systems, nice um, uh, buildings. Um, and I hope that um, uh, I can 
show some of the examples where I think midden should be used, the results of midden should be used more than, uh, than by now. Um, for example, the industry um, cannot do it alone. It's dependent on other sectors. So we need a system approach. And if you look at the midden studies, you can see the elements of that, but I want to see it also translated in the models that are used for calculating the effectiveness, of, for instance, of levies or, or subsidies. Um, one example, electrical boilers, they can only be subsidized for a limited number of hours because there's not enough green power yet. Um, electrification um, is very essential for um, CO2 reduction in the industry, but the infrastructure has to be there in time. Scope two and three emissions um, are not rewarded in the system by now, but they are very important. The whole feedstock issue um, for, for matters of circularity, we need more insight into that and it, it needs to be translated in the models as well. So what else is needed? I think that if we look at what is done in the industry in, in, uh, in order to um, to comply with the climate agreement, there were cluster energy strategies formulated. These were bundled in the MEEC, um, and these plans were evaluated recently by PBL, TNO, and RVO. And, uh, and they say, well, it's robust plans. Um, the targets can be met uh, if these plans are implemented, but industrial power demand triples from 43 terawatt hours now to 128 in 2030 triples in just nine years time well that that raises the question where are we gonna get all that green energy that's necessary and how is will the inf infrastructure that we need to bring this power from the windmills to the factories how will that be created in such short time and so far i've not seen inc that included in the models um, that are used by the Nederlandse Bank or by uh, Centraal Plan Bureau uh, to show how easy it is to reduce emissions when you just introduce a levy. So that's one thing. What else is needed? Um, if we look at innovation, um, the, the 2030 targets um, give a, a tremendous pressure on industry to, um, to take measures now. So R&D budgets are um, put in place for the high TRL levels, which provide results uh, on the ground immediately. We need, however, more expense uh, on the levels three to seven, because those technologies we're gonna, use, we're gonna need in the future uh, badly. Um, in 2050, half of the reductions will come from technologies that are currently still at the demo or at the prototype phase. Um, in this rather complicated slide from the IAA uh, Net Zero uh, report, uh, you can see that um, this is a very, yeah, on the left you see all the mitigation options that we have, and um, that's fine, we can, we can make it according to the IAA, but on the right, well, that doesn't, yeah, it works. You see in which phase of um, uh, development those options are, and you see that the bottom half that is um, mature or in the market uptake, but the upper half still is prototype or demo at the moment. So a lot of work still has to be done. And what do we need in order to make that happen? We need a longer term target than just 2030. We need a long term target and we need logical intermediate goals. For we must realize that for the heavy industry, the year 25, 2050 is just one investment cycle away because the blast furnaces or the cement kilns, they have a lifetime of about 40 years. Um, so just one investment between now and 2050. And that critical window to develop all the new options should not be missed uh, that we have in the next 10 years. A long-term master plan is important, um, and that could provide the certainty that the next wave of investments in capacity additions will help to, re to, to introduce the near zero emissions technology. And that plan should be apolitical, flexible, fair, and transparent. So my conclusions, keep Midden up to date. We need good bricks. Look more into the system dependency 
merge the mineral results into a long-term master plan, and long-term is 2050, that's not so long, and do more on outreach, combine the good work with, for example, the platform for Duurzaming Industry, PVI website, where um, companies can see what, what is available for them. And then my conclusion is keep Midden in front, firm results of notable teamwork. Thank you for your attention. You heard John um, for your talk. Um, we certainly agree with you that a system approach is needed and uh, long term plans as well are needed. And I'd like to ask the audience if you have some questions uh, for her, Jan, to please place them in the chat. I'd seen no questions yet, but maybe um, I'd like to ask you if you can elaborate on what are the main bottlenecks for the Dutch industry companies to, uh, to the, go to a transition? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that is a good question. Um... I think some of them were in my talk already. What is essential for industry is that they um, can trust in politics for, for a somewhat longer term, um, that they need uh, an amount of certainty. And that certainty is not in targets that keep moving all the time. So whereas 2050 is not so far away, I would say 2050 zero emissions is is the clear target and 2030 um, we need we need an intermediate target but that should be derived from the road to 2050 um, that road should be could be could be made more clear if we invest in making the vision for 2050 with each other there is no clear vision that i i found the iea net zero report a very good attempt to show what, 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 what we need in order to arrive at zero in 2050 for all sectors, and industry is just a part of that. Um, if we have that, then we can see what bottlenecks are on the road. And it's my impression that electricity is one of the profound bottlenecks for the industry. Um, for practically all options, we need more electricity, green electricity at first, but then it should be available and um, it's really a lot because for all reductions options, whether it's CCS, whether it's hydrogen, whether it is uh, circularity, um, for all of it, you need a lot of electricity. So let's invest in the electricity system. And if government provides a clear policy on that, that would be very helpful to give industry the trust that they can take their, uh, their investment decisions. Thank you. Herjan, indeed, a clear vision is needed, and hopefully, with Miden, we can also uh, we create an incentive by providing this knowledge base for more um, more scenario studies and, and analysis that can be done uh, up to 2050, and be able to better identify these bottlenecks. Um, okay, I would then um, like to give the word to Ernst Vorel. Yeah, thank you. I'm online. Yeah. I'm share my screen i hope everybody can see it is it visible on the screen yeah, yeah. good yes thank you it is. <laughs> then thank you for uh, for the invitation thank you for well being here i'm actually uh, uh, not in the hague right now because i want to limit travel uh due to the COVID situation um but i'm, I'm really happy to be here among all of us in uh, well in this virtual environment um, I would like to, uh, um, well, to, to, to take a look at, this, at, at, this, uh, at how this future could look like. <clears throat> um, and the key messages that I want to, to, make, to convey is that there is no one size that fits all industry because industry is so diverse, which because all of us already knew. But like, let me try to illustrate that. <clears throat> but at first, let me, let's set out the, the, the rules where we are today. And what we need, we need to, to really internalize is that uh, like in 30 years, we really need to turn around basically how we've been running our economy for the past 200 years. And of course, we knew that already in 1992 when we signed the agreement in Rio, but uh, we have been sitting on our hands basically for 30 years, and now we've got only 30 years left. And because we've been sitting on our hands, the task has even become more urgent because we need, we're need talking about a CO2 budget. So not only the target is important, but also the, the way that we get there. 
Because we've been sitting on our hands, there are also no exemptions. We, we need to do all this. And that means all countries, all sectors. There's no single sector that can say, like, we, we won't do anything uh, because, uh, because we are so important or we, are, we don't have opportunities. No, it's all of us. Um, and that is, that is a challenge. Um, and and there, of course, at the same time, we have to deal now with a whole range of challenges in industry. Uh, think about our availability of resources, availability of natural resources. We see a return of geopolitics. Um, there is a lot of environmental pressure on um, uh, like air pollution, but also land use because of biodiversity. And at the same time, we see also jumps in new technology development. So industry needs to respond to that. And there's a whole range of responses that, that can be included in that. So the question, of course, is what does each of these responses can, how can they play, how can they contribute, and how can they contribute to multiple challenges, so not to a single challenge uh, in itself. But all together, all these things, they form what I call a perfect storm. <clears throat> um, and, and I see this, this, this bulk carrier from which this picture is taken uh, as, our, uh, as our industrial production system and consumption system, if you wish. Um, and we see this storm coming and we need to turn the ship. And as we all know, turning a bulk carrier is a, uh, Takes, takes time. So we need to steer, actually now already, we, we, we should have been steered away from the storm 30 years ago, but we haven't. Um, so now we have even a little, uh, a little mileage to go before we, uh, we have to steer away the ship. But this is really the, the key challenge. The good news is, and I think that also a little bit uh, <clears throat> was behind what Gert Jan just said, is that um, there, the renewable energy is becoming, uh, and rapidly, they're one of the cheapest forms of electricity. Um, and basically it's come down because of technical learning and mass production. Um, and even if you do the external costs, in many parts of the world, uh, renewables are already the, the lowest uh, form of electricity production. Um, and that makes it easier to decarbonize the power sector. Um, and that makes electrification, of course, key strategy for all sectors. But of course, this brings us challenges uh, with them, because how do we make that electricity? Where do we make it? And how do we get it to our customers? Um, so, and it, this is something that is playing around the globe. Eh? So th that's something really important to remember. This is playing out in every country. And I, I will give a few examples of some work I did in the United States for the US Environmental Protection Agency, which was then used uh, for the Biden plan, which went into the Glasgow conference. And I will present some results of that. <clears throat> uh, so what's playing out here in the Netherlands plays out in the United States as well, plays out in other European countries, plays out in China. Um, so, and we see now, and, and of course, for the years we haven't done much, we now see the realization in policy making that industry is not happening by itself. Policy makers thought that well, industry will take care of itself, uh, but of course, it's not possible because we need all the systemic changes. <clears throat> um, so there's this whole menu of opportunities for which we can choose. And uh, it's not a set menu. Uh, we can choose or we have to choose, and we have to choose a wise combination. Um, that fits uh, our appetite. <clears throat> and just give you a few examples. Uh, and, and for some industries, it's going to be easier than for other industries. Uh, one industry where it's relatively easy, that, that's the food industry, you could say, uh, because it works at really low, relatively low temperatures. Uh, it can generate some of its own energy. Um, and there's also still a large potential for energy efficiency improvement in that industry uh, around the globe. And on the right, you see a picture of uh, the first uh, fully electric whiskey distillery, which is opened in Lebanon, Kentucky, uh, just uh, two months ago. It's fully electric. It, it, it purchases electricity from a, uh, from a PPA, from a wind farm. So it's, it's zero carbon. And as you can see, there is no stack, no chimney on this distillery, which normally you would have seen. Um, so you can see that the world is not sitting idle, even in the United States, where we have always seen as kind of uh, a place that's way behind the climate policy, except, the, except the, of course, the, the last the administration. <coughs> uh, think companies are moving um, uh, there as well. And of course, steel industry, uh, widely discussed in the Netherlands uh, recently, in, especially in the media. Um, and there's, there's still improvements for energy efficiency improvement possible in some of the furnaces and some of the technologies which can hard, be difficult to replace. But the key thing, of course, is how are we going to make iron? We, in the future, we're still going to need some iron, despite a move to a circular economy, uh, because iron, well, steel likes to corrode, so we always need some steel, additional steel, and especially some of these new renewable energy technologies also need steel, like wind turbines. So how are we going to make the iron? And then we're two options, 
uh, Hisarna, which was developed in, uh, uh, in, in here at Eimuiden, uh, with combined with CCS, um, or we could go the hydrogen-based route, which is now uh, demonstrated at in the hybrid plant in Sweden. And this summer, they, they produced the first batch, very small batch, of, uh, of carbon-free uh, iron, the first carbon-free iron produced in the world. <clears throat> and then, yeah, a really important one for us from the Netherlands, the chemical industry. And that's, uh, that's, and that's why you see a question mark here, uh, because the, the chemical industry really relies on fossil feedstocks. So how do we make this industry carbon neutral? That, that's really going to be a challenge. But I think you can here apply uh, multiple uh, applications and it's going to be found in material efficiency or changing, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, how we, how we use the materials which are produced by the chemical industry. Uh, there's a role for bio-based chemicals, CCS, CCU, and, and also electrification, not to reach And this is a picture actually of Dow Chemical uh, in, uh, in the south of the Netherlands, which actually is running some experiments with heat pumps. But how do this picture look like for the United States? Now, that's shown in this graph. Um, funny enough, the, the US baseline, some baseline scenario, which was developed still under the Trump administration, uh, because there was like a, a little bit delay between the, the publications of the, uh, by, the, by the Energy Information Administration and, uh, and when they start to work, of course, uh, is that there's still going to be tremendous growth of emissions in the US under business as usual, uh, which of course is, is unlikely to happen. But we, we still had, we took this scenario and looked at what kind of um, developments are taking place. And we basically, I mean, of all those, I just showed you some of the examples of what we have, but you could do in different uh, sectors. We added them up to have a bottom of estimate of how you could combine them in a smart way. And then what are then the key opportunities? And what you see here is that energy efficiency is going to remain important. Um, that we see electrification, which is the, the, the last bar, the grid inter, in, interaction, we call it here. Uh, electrification and the decarbonization of the, the power grid are really key uh, contributors. But you can also see that other parts also play a, a, a big role. Um, uh, material efficiency, that's called here yeah, ME, and you see refinery ME, well, that, which basically is because of the move to electric transport, um, yeah, a, a large chunk of the refining industry will just disappear. And that's a lesson we need to accept. Um, there's, there's, of course, a shift to feedstocks happening uh, in refining in some, uh, some countries, but there's only so much feedstocks we can use given all these other considerations. So basically, we also here in the Netherlands, we need to accept that a part of the refinery industry will not be with us uh, in, uh, in, in a few decades. Um, and this is what you see here, but also the switch to a circular economy is going to be important in a lot of other sectors. And then we try to summarize that, how does it look like? And then what you see here, uh, we try to see in which sectors, and this is for the US, so for, for the Netherlands, it's going to be a little bit different. But what you see here is that how these contributions of all those different uh, ways that you could reduce emissions varies by sector. <clears throat> and what you can see, of course, is in the, in the, in the flavors of green and, and yellow, those are the things that are really are going to be important, energy material efficiency. And, and then you also see that some things are going to be more important or less important in other industries. If you see electrification, again, it's also a lot of uh, yellow and green, so that is going to be important uh, for, for most sectors, where, where we see like, for instance, hydrogen is only going to be important or, or medium important for a few industries. So all the talk we have about hydrogen, um, yeah, it's only going to be important for a number of industries, including the chemical industry, of course. Um, so that brings me then to the key messages of, of today's presentation. Um, so we're facing a perfect storm, uh, and for that we need an integrated response. <clears throat> and at the same time, what we see is that the energy paradigm is really shifting, yeah, where we have built an industry on the assumption of cheap fuel, which turned out not to be so cheap because of climate change. <clears throat> um, we are seeing now that electricity is becoming a cheap form of energy. And that really would change the dynamics how we develop technologies. But of course, it's to realize that there is going to be no free electricity. There's no free lunch, no free electricity. Electricity will always cost money. And that's why it's important to use technologies that can use the electricity in the most efficient way possible. And to do that first before we start moving down the way uh, to, to less efficient options. <clears throat> um, but this, over time, this, of course, will, will really change how we develop technologies. We've developed in the chemical industry a lot of thermal technologies. 
because thermal energy was cheap. <clears throat> but now we're moving to an era where power is cheap, likely electrochemical processes will become much more important in the future. And, and how do we accommodate that in our industry? <clears throat> the other thing is there's no silver bullet. Huh? There's, as I said, there's a menu of opportunities and each sector and each plant, and this is where the midden database, where we have an advantage in Netherlands, but we have this midden database, <clears throat> we have to select out of that menu the opportunities which make the, the wisest combination for that specific sector and for that specific site. Uh, and that is really a great advantage that we have already have this data in the Midden uh, database. Yeah, and the other things which came down of other analysis of, 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 the, of the US industry, and which is also, uh, I think, valid for, for the Dutch industry, is that energy efficiency is still the foundation for decarbonization for the next few decades. And that the transition to a circular economy is going to be really important because it will not only save the amount of materials that we use and includes uh, recycling typically takes less energy than producing for virtual materials, but it really it will make change the structure of the industry and that we need to understand to make good forecasts of what do we need in the future. Electrification turns out to be key and we can start now, especially in those low temperature industries where we have, where we have technologies. And the other options also need to be de de developed and we need to really think, and I think that's what Fabian's statement about <coughs> Uh, the infrastructure development, that's really key. And we know this is going to happen. We need to, to develop that infrastructure and that needs for electricity, but also for example, for CCS and, and others uh, for as long as we are going to need that. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Ernst. Um... Yeah, thank you for highlighting that there is a menu of opportunities. And again, we hear the message that an integrated approach is needed. Thank you for sharing with us these leading, this leading examples on a zero carbon industry. Um, and um, one question for you maybe is why is the challenge for industry larger than for other sectors? Yeah, well, for some of the other sectors, I mean, basically we already have the technology. So the power sector, uh, because we have the intermittence problem uh, and energy storage is where we, there we see like, of course, a lot of developments now ongoing. Um, for for uh, the buildings sector, which is uh, basically you could say like roughly uh, one third of energy globally goes to buildings. Uh, well, a little bit more than one third, one third to industry and one third to transport and a little bit less to transport still. Um, and um, so for buildings, it is, uh, yeah, it is a relatively easy solution in the sense we have the technology. Um, the, the key thing is there is to, to apply those technologies. And, and, and we have known for decades how to build homes that hardly need any heating. We have not done it for many reasons because of lobbying of the construction industry, for example, <coughs> and, and, and other reasons. But there's a, the challenge there is basically is, is to, to get going. Uh, because we don't have enough hands to do it. Eh? It's, a, it's a practical problem that we, we need people to do it. We need the technological knowledge. But the technology is there. For transport, we see a kind of a, 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 a double story. On one hand, uh, uh, automotive transportation, of course, electrification is really coming up rapidly, more rapidly than we expected. And there are also advantages of that because we can use electric cars also to stabilize the grid. Um, so there's a lot of interaction there that actually might accelerate that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, yes, we have still have a problem for uh, long term, uh, long distance and heavy transport, um, but technologies are being worked on. And then for industry, for the lighter industries, yes, we have some solutions, but especially for the heavy industry, um, the challenges are more important because we have these high temperature processes, which are hard to decarbonize. Uh, and then that, that's where you can have a discussion about electrification versus uh, hydrogen uh, or CCS. Um, um, and also, as Gajan also highlighted, um, these are our are, are technology. Well, we built these things for long term. So um, this, 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 the long lifetime of these equipment uh, makes it also a challenge if you want to achieve something within a, short, within a very short time frame, because 30 years is very short for industrial infrastructure. OK, thank you. We also have uh, questions from chat. Um, there's one question from Mark Sporma. How can electrification be interesting for companies now? A good question. I think, um, I mean, it's, well, it's, it's, it's one example of, of, uh, of, of this distillery. Take this example is from, from Diaccio, which is globally operating uh, uh, yeah, drinks industry. 
um, for them, of course, it, there's, there's a lot of value in it to have like the, the first CO2 free whiskey, uh, the first carbon free whiskey, uh, except for the carbon which is in, in the whiskey itself, uh, in, in the ethanol. Um, um, so for, for business to uh, consumers, it's, it's probably already attractive to do it now. Um, but the other thing is, yeah, we need to, we need to basically, um, and, and, and there are also electrification technologies like heat pumps, which are already attractive. If we can do something about the price differential between electricity and, and fuel, and of course we need to make electricity available, the green electricity. Um, and, and so for actually small consumers, the problem now is that most of the taxation is on electricity and not on fuel. So this is something where you can play with. And of course we need to really invest in providing that power and not just selling it straight away to a new, uh, to another, um, data center maybe because we, we need that power ourselves right now. <clears throat> um, and, um, uh, and we, we have to build infrastructure to make it available at the right time and the right place. Okay, thank you, Ernst. Um, yeah, I think due to the time, I think it's, uh, yeah, we need to proceed to the next session. So thanks, uh, Ernst, for your presentation and answering the questions. Um, I now give the word to Marit van Hout from PVL. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marit van Hout and I'm a researcher at PVL. And in this presentation, I will discuss the modeling of the industry in the climate and energy outlook that we also ever abbreviate as the GAF. Uh, the GAF gives uh, an annual update of uh, the developments around uh, energy and emissions in uh, the Dutch energy uh, system and the contribution of the Dutch uh, policies. Uh, the GAF and especially the forecasts that go up to 230, 235, um, behind this is a significant set of models that we utilize of which uh, the safe production uh, model, which is the model for uh, industry. And um, this will be the model uh, I'm going to discuss in this uh, presentation. But before um, I move into the details of the safe uh, production uh, model, I first want to give you a heads up on the main sites of the industry that we can see in the climate and energy outlook of 2021. Um, this graph shows uh, the total greenhouse gas emissions in the industry um, over time. Um, if we look in between 210 to 20, then uh, we see the total greenhouse gas emissions are rather stable. Um, and the climate and energy uh, outlook for the prognoses of the future anticipate that there will be a significant uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and especially uh, after 2025, when there will be uh, more options um, becoming available and uh, the uptake of greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction and uh, its investments uh, will be stimulated further. Um, the main contribution of uh, the greenhouse gas emission reduction option is coming from uh, carbon capture and storage. After that, followed by electrification, energy savings, and also partly by investments in uh, measures around other greenhouse gas reduction uh, options. The main policy uh, impulses are uh, through the CO2 uh, levy for the Netherlands, as well as the SDE uh, subsidies that further stimulate low carbon uh, investments. Uh, the CO2 levy in the Netherlands uh, became effective as of 2021, and it is set up as a minimum uh, CO2 uh, price. So there is a clear uh, relation with uh, the EUTS uh, price. And um, it started off in 2021 uh, with a relative low EUTS or with a relative low price of 30 euro per ton and gradually increasing up to 125 uh, euros uh, per ton. Whereas part of the emissions in uh, the industry are exempted from falling under the uh, CO2 uh, levy. This is what we call the dispensation uh, rights. And the dispensation rights over time are gradually uh, decreasing. And hence the CO2 levy and the impact uh, of the CO2 uh, levy will be more pronounced as we move up to 230. On the other hand, we have the SDE uh, subsidies that also stimulate uh, low carbon investments. And both of these uh, policy measures uh, will have an impact on uh, the total investments and the total uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, options. 
but it must be indicated even though uh, the climate and energy outlook provides one point of value that the uncertainties are significant and that's why also a bandwidth is given for a uh, 230. It could, for example, be the case that uh, one of uh, the carbon and capture uh, storage options, which are relatively large, uh, unique options, that they face some delay and are not available in time before 2.30. So uncertainties are significant and must be indicated and are probably even uh, more important than just uh, the single point value for the GAF. So what's behind uh, all these data and how do we come up with uh, these prognoses? Um, that is what we utilize the safe production model for, the model for the industry. But it must be noted that this model, uh, the safe production model is not a model in itself and it has uh, clear relations with uh, other types of models. It runs within the whole uh, GEF central uh, scenario where we have um, uh, assumptions like uh, fuel prices, uh, EU ETS prices, that are uh, part of the whole central scenario and um, that are uh, uh, taken as assumptions for uh, many of the models. Safe production uh, has clear interactions with uh, some other mo models uh, that are relevant for modeling the industry as well. Like we have a refineries uh, model that provides input to the safe uh, production uh, model uh, because safe production uh, does include the investments of CCS options, as well as uh, combined heat and power uh, options. On the other hand, um, we also have the renewables um, model that looks into the total uh, uh, yeah, in growth of options like um, uh, solar panels and uh, wind uh, farms, etc., and can also take a certain claim on um, uh, is there some water, maybe? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, the safe uh, production um, model also uses a significant amount of the SDE uh, budgets, but it should be balanced with uh, the other SDE claims in the renewables uh, model. So that's why there is an interaction uh, there. Uh, as regards to the uptake of electric electrification options, such as electric boilers, uh, it might have an impact on the uh, electricity uh, demand, and hence we also need uh, clear uh, interactions with the electricity market model, because it have, can have a significant impact on the electricity uh, price as well. So hence we also take into account the uh, interactions uh, there. Um, the safe production model is a model for the Netherlands, and we have uh, various regional clusters included that um, Kajan already uh, showed. Um, some of these uh, clusters, yeah, we include in order to have the regional trade-offs, is the infrastructure ready or not? Um, and we have a sixth cluster, which is the cluster uh, other, covering uh, the rest of the Netherlands. Um, we have various uh, uh, technologies included in the model. Um, some of these are generic, so they can be applied in several sectors as well as uh, several uh, clusters as well. And we have a unique uh, projects that we include in the model. Um, those are located in a single sector and a single uh, cluster and uh, are only linked to that. So behind this uh, data set is a significant um, set of options and hence uh, the database required in order to do model runs with safe production is quite extensive. And this is also where a meta comes in. So what do we implement uh, in the model? Uh, we need to make assumptions, of course, on what will uh, be uh, the production level in a certain year uh, for a certain sector. Um, we need price data on investment costs, fuel prices, EUTS prices. Uh, we have a significant technology uh, database, and this is also where MIDA comes in. We make uh, quite a lot of use of the MIDA data. Um, we have assumptions on uh, when options will be available, efficiencies, things like that will be a significant input to the model. 
And of course, we need a policy input, like how is the CO2 levy structured and what are the specific details around the policies and how to calculate the SDE subsidies. That will have an impact on how the model should be operated and the model results itself. Uh, the safe reduction model is set up as an optimization uh, model, so it has uh, the objective and it can choose its uh, optimal values for investments as well as for uh, the utilization of certain options, choosing these values by minimizing uh, the total discounted uh, cash flows for all the sectors as indicated by S in this formula for a set of uh, years that fall within the window of foresight period. So it's a multiple uh, year model. Uh, the R indicates the discount uh, factor in order to uh, discount all the cash flows. We include several types of uh, cash flows like uh, the subsidies, which are included in the objective as an income uh, flow. And we include various uh, other types of costs like investment costs, uh, operating expenditures, and of course also the potential costs for, uh, that are related to the CO2 uh, levy. The model should be considering a, a few um, constraints that, for example, take into account that the thermal demand should match uh, thermal supply. And of course, gap capacity constraints that limit uh, the total uptake of certain uh, options. So these uh, various um, um, constraints need to be implemented into the model, but this is not the full list, only a grasp of uh, the most important ones. Then what results out of the model um, are, for example, investments and also the investment cost, uh, CO2 uh, levy payments, emissions, input and output flows uh, per option. And with these type of results, we can do various type of assessments with the model. Um, and in order to uh, wrap up, uh, safe production already proven itself to be a valuable tool to assess uh, the Dutch uh, policy and to assess the Dutch uh, industry. It has a significant level uh, of detail, but it should be noted that it's not meant for forecasting. So it's not a model to uh, estimate or to um, yeah, forecast what the future would look like, but the data is of high importance and it's a tool to assess what if questions. And hence the quality of your data is of high importance for your model results as well. And that's why MIDA and the quality of MIDA is very important. Um, for the model, it's continuously updated. Uh, model code improvements, of course. The policy design could change. Um, we could have uh, different categories for SDE, for example, that should also be implemented in the model. Um, and of course, yeah, we are a high uh, or significant consumer of uh, metadata and um, and uh, yeah, for the further implementation for the coming years, uh, we will be using the metadata even further. So thank you. Well, thank you, Marit, for sharing your insights on modeling the climate and energy outlook. We've got a couple of questions from the chat about the model. And the first one is from Germán Morales. About what is the, imp the, the time resolution of the model? Is it hourly? Is it the same for all technologies? And how long does it take to solve? Uh, it takes about eight hours to solve a full model, but um, we cannot run all the hours in a year because um, yeah, we also interact with the electricity market model. That is an hourly model. Uh, but we do uh, represent the year through uh, time slices. So we uh, use uh, several characteristics like is uh, the electricity price between zero and 10. This is one time slice, for example. So the number of time slices uh, determines the level of detail on, an, on, a, on a yearly basis. And if you increase the number of time uh, slices, of course, your model run will also take uh, longer. But yeah, what we choose now is about eight hours in total. The, the run time, I mean. Okay, and we've got another question from Rajesh Mehta. On, are these demand supply models or steady state material flow and energy balance models? Um, I think what he means is that uh, we have uh, 
a, a scenario assumption, for example, for the amount of steel that needs to be uh, produced. And this is a fixed assumption in uh, the model. So uh, the model needs to come up with uh, all the ingrowth of options and investments in order to come up with uh, this amount of uh, production. And um, yeah, so it's not in that sense an, an LCE, LCA model taking into account all the all the yeah the trade-offs. I mean, hey, and maybe one extra question before we go to the break: Has it been difficult to model the new Dutch CO2 tax? Uh, yeah, it has been quite a challenge uh, to do that, indeed. Um, but um, yeah, it, it also depends on how clear is a policy and what can we implement and what not. But I think, uh, in that sense, an optimization model uh, works quite well because you can have the correct trade-offs between competition uh, of options as well as constraints like is there a maximum budget for uh, SDE, and also how should we account for certain emissions and um, where should they fall uh, under. So I think optimization models is, is, is a good way uh, or, yeah, helps in uh, yeah, setting up the model in line with uh, the CO2 uh, levy. Okay. Thank you very much, Marit, from your presentation. And now we go to a coffee break and uh, we, hope we will be back at uh, 3.35. Um, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back from the break. And uh, now I w uh, we will proceed to the next session with Hattie Bolmran from TNO. Now. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Hattie Bolmran indeed. I work at, uh, at TNO. Uh, I did a project together with some other colleagues with uh, Lauren Klispai, Peter Mulder, and Floris Staminau. So, what did we do in this project? Um, we looked at the following question. Uh, the question that we aim to answer in, uh, in this project was, can the Dutch chemical sector afford uh, to decarbonize? So that is, in case it would decarbonize, would it actually harm the profits and would it uh, risk companies, chemical companies to leave or relocate their, their Dutch plants? Um, which subsectors did we look at? We looked at the biggest subsectors of the chemical companies uh, in the Netherlands, which are the ones that you can see here on the slide. Industrial gases, organic basic chemicals, fertilizers and nitrogen compounds. Um, for this project, there is actually a link with the Midden database and the Midden project, uh, because we use the database in our analysis, for example, for the reduction in CO2 emissions that could potentially be achieved with the decarbonization options, but also for the, the cost, because we are uh, in, our, in our analysis, we do more or less um, kind of a, a business case. Uh, also, I would like to state that the work that we've done is really pre preliminary. Uh, this presentation is also uh, somehow a way to uh, start a discussion how we could improve the data, the methodology, or perhaps there are other ways to see whether uh, the chemical sector can afford the decarbonization options. Um, let's take a look at the 10 biggest firms, chemical firms in the ne Netherlands in terms of emissions. You will see them here uh, in this slide. Uh, the 10 biggest chemical companies actually amount in total up till about 80% of total emissions of that sector. The total chemical sector uh, amounts around 10% of all emissions in the Netherlands in CO2 emissions. So then you have an idea about how many emissions we're talking in this case. Um, the scope. So in order to, to answer the question, can the Dutch chemical sector afford decarbonization? We looked at it from different angles. We didn't just look at the Netherlands itself because uh, the world is bigger than that, basically. We also looked at the chemical sectors globally. So what is the financial state of those companies uh, globally? So first of all, we looked at the 10 biggest. What's happening with their profit? Is it kind of stable? What's happening with their, uh, with their revenues? How much debt are they, uh, are they having over the last couple of years? And can they actually um, pay for the debt given the increase in, in revenue that they're facing. 
uh, we've, uh, other, other than that, we look, of course, at the 10 biggest Dutch plants uh, and their own global ultimate owner. We know that the Netherlands is the fourth, fourth largest chemical producer in Europe and the tenth worldwide. But the question is, how big is the share of the plants in the Netherlands as part of the global ultimate owner? So um, the decarbonization options in the Netherlands, how much will it impact the decision of the global ultimate owner? Uh, we used a lot of data sources for our analysis. Um, first of all, we used, of course, the Midden database, as mentioned. We also used CBS data for uh, having a general idea about the Dutch sector. Um, the Refinitiv database gave a lot of information on the balance sheet, on the income statements, to have an idea about the financial state of the global ultimate owners. Uh, annual accounts from the Kamer van Koophandel and the REACH database gave us insight in the plant level uh, financial state. Uh, that was actually a lot of nitty gritty work to get into those, uh, into those reports. Um, and there were some other studies of which we could make use. Um, yeah, basically, if we look at some results, we don't, well, I'm not going to present everything that, that we found, but just to have an idea of what is the state, the financial state of, uh, of the companies. In the Netherlands, it involves about 5,000 employees. So in case chemical companies would even consider relocating their location, then we know about how much employment we're dealing with in this case. Um, actually, we found that over the last 20 years, it's, well, 20 years for the, the global companies, it's actually going very well. The net sales, the profits, all going very well. We even see that uh, the, the debt as a share of net sales is also uh, going very well. And we were actually wondering, are they sticking to their core business? Are they sticking in terms of investments and spending their money on making investment in their capital? Or are they uh, spending also a lot of money on uh, paying dividends to the shareholders or buy, buying back their shares. So, uh, but we actually found this is a positive answer. The, we found that they are spending their money in the way that you hope they spend it on their core business. Uh, then the top 10 biggest emitters in the Netherlands, we find that they're actually only a small part of their global ultimate owner. We can see that in the next slide. Um, Yara Sluiskill, for example, only 7%. It's huge in the Netherlands, the plants, but as a share, it's only, uh, as a share of the global ultimate owner, it's only small. And also the others are quite small. For some of them, we actually miss the annual reports. So this is also a bit of a call, like it would be convenient if, the, convenient if those would be available also for uh, further analysis. OCI Nitrogen is the one uh, where actually a big share of their revenue is coming from the Dutch plant. Uh, here we have just an idea about the profit of these uh, Dutch chemical plants, how they are, uh, how they were in the last 10 years. They fluctuate a lot, but the main message is they were all positive and uh, still over the years more or less uh, stable. Uh, what I would like to mention, in our analysis, we're going to see what if we decarbonize, what would be the effect on the profit? So if we look at the profit before decarbonization, we should look at the past. So here you see it fluctuates a lot. So if you look at only one year, then, and you pick, for example, for a firm, a year where it's not going that well in that year, then it's not a realistic situation. So we aim to take, for example, the average of the last four years in order to compare. Okay. Um, so, firms, can firms afford decarbonization? How do we analyze it? We look actually at different investment options. First of all, not, we do not invest, or uh, a firm might have multiple investment options. Uh, in an example, we explain what the investment options could look like. If it does not invest, it doesn't have investment costs, but it will have a very high CO2 tax. If it will invest, it will have some investment costs, but lower CO2 tax. But is that lower CO2 tax enough to actually uh, make it a profitable situation for this firm? Um, we look at two future situations. One is extreme, where we assume there will be a carbon price of 125 euros per ton. This is called the social cost where well, the social cost of carbon, where it actually 
takes into account that there will be climate impact and this price is high enough to cover for that. Uh, in the same extreme scenario, we assume that there will be no free allowances for the chemical company, which will make it a big impact. But in that situation, we will see what is the worst case scenario for the chemical company. Uh, second, we look at a, a more, let's say, moderate scenario, lower CO2 price, and part of the allowances are actually uh, free for those companies. Uh, this is an example that I would like to explain. It's a hypothetical uh, example, but it might give you an insight in the approach that we took. Uh, in this case, three investment options, one option not to invest. Uh, what was the situation before there were these three op four options? Um, we look at both the plant level profits and the global ultimate owner profits, because it might be that the global ultimate owner is able to help um, to partly fund for the decarbonization option. Uh, here we have the investment cost. Uh, these storage and transport are actually also investment cost. We assume that there will be, let's say, a 20 years depreciation. This is also an assumption that's up for discussion, of course. One question that we have is the storage and transport investment cost. Will it be paid by the company, by the, by the plant, or will it be paid by another institute, perhaps the government or by... Um, uh, or will it be shared among other institutes? So this is an que important question because these are substantial costs and it will definitely affect the business case. Operational costs are, for example, uh, maintenance costs. As you see, we don't know them for all the investment options in this, uh, in this example. Um, so we would like to discuss, for example, those things in case we are discussing together with, uh, with companies. Heat and electricity, it is possible that some options actually have extra electricity cost. Um, I will quickly move on actually to the next slide. There are other assumptions here as well in this example. And it's important to note that for uh, the last option, green hydrogen, we did not take into account the feedstock because we assume that, for example, natural gas will cost the company money, but also uh, the cost of electricity, for example. Will it weigh out? Will it uh, be compensated by each other or not? Uh, so, a lot of costs have to be made, but what then what is the reduction in emissions? Um, not all options affect all emissions of the company. It will all, almost always affect only part of the emissions. So for each of the options, we made assumptions or we found data on what the re emission reduction would be. And given the two different prices, we can also um, actually put a value to it. How much will it cost? How much will it cost the company or the plant when uh, it invests in such an option? Taking everything together, all the values, we actually find in the next slide uh, what will be the effect, the expected effect on the profit uh, in the future after decarbonization options. In the left uh, figure, you see that. Well, on the, the dashed bar, you see what the profits were before, so in the current situation, around 80 million. And in the bars, you see that in all, in all scenarios, including not investing, uh, it will actually result in a negative profit. Most negative in case you do not invest, but still negative in all the other options. Notice that this is also the situation where we have in the, well, the least favorite situation, the highest CO2 price, the, um, also, no CO2 allowances. In the figure on the right-hand side, you actually see where those negative, well, the negative business case is coming from. And the biggest share of the bars is CO2 costs. So CO2 is still a big reason. Well, paying for CO2 is a big reason why it gives us a negative business case. Uh, next slide looks, well, looks at a more moderate situation, more friendly also for the chemical industry. There, most profits are close to zero. Well, the excess is in millions, but still closer to zero than before, and sometimes slightly positive. And this is also due to the free allowances and, of course, that th they have to pay less money uh, per ton of CO2. Uh, next, on to the discussion points. So what have we seen in this presentation? Uh, first of all, actually, currently, the chemical firms are doing it quite good. Their, um, their, their financial status is looking good. The, it seems like they're making the right decisions in terms of investments. 
Uh, however, in the future, if we are going to decarbonize, what will happen to the future profit? If everything remains the same, I, I didn't mention that before, but if everything else remains the same, so they're not going to produce more in the future, for example, but the only thing that changes is the carbon price and is the investment cost, then we will find that there will, we expect substantial losses in this, well, in this example that we give. Uh, so in two situations, if they do not decarbonize and if they do decarbonize. So we do understand that there is, let's say, a risk for carbon leakage. And uh, we actually claim, OK, we claim that the carbon border tax is in that case crucial. Uh, I would like to leave it with that. We started with a question. We actually also end with a question, uh, which is, is there a sustainable business model possible in the future? Um, under a high carbon price and an, um, uh, a carbon border tax. I would like to leave it with this. OK, thank you very much, Hattie, um, for giving us, uh, well, discussing this innovative analysis study. Um, I think there is a question from, from, uh, from the chat um, from Francisco Garcia, is the 125 euro per ton so unrealistic, being that the current price is already at above 60? No, I don't think it's that realist, uh, unrealistic. I've seen that uh, it was also in the presentation of uh, the person presenting before me. There they also assumed a carbon price of 125 euros in 2030. Uh, so it's definitely not unrealistic. Okay, and we have a uh, yeah, last question uh, before we pass to the next session from Martin van Engelenburg. Would be interesting to see what impact this would have on product prices for consumers. Small statement. <laughs> that is indeed an interesting question uh, because no matter how you uh, how you fund it whether it's via the government or whether it's via bo carbon border taxes, of course, it will raise the price in the end for the consumers. Uh, so to be honest, I think they will definitely raise. But the question is, perhaps we have to go to a more sustainable society. So we also have to take into account that we use less products, less mm -hmm. energy. So also households, the end producers. So because we're discussing product prices, uh, I think it might be necessary that we all limit ourselves just a little more. Okay, thank you yeah. for your reply. Thank you for the questions. Um, then uh, we would like to pass to the next session from Corian Brink. I'd like to invite you. Okay. Good afternoon. So this last session will be on the Fit for Five, uh, Fit for Fifty Five package of the European Commission, and actually it's it's. Not using midden, uh, but I think a midden will be very relevant in the further steps that are needed to to uh, analyze this uh, uh, the implications of the fit for fifty five for the for the Dutch industry. So first, I will give a brief outline of the the EU climate and energy framework as it is now, and then I will describe the main elements of the fit for fifty five package uh, before I will uh, go more into detail into the implications for the industry in the Netherlands. Uh, so the climate and energy framework of the EU, which uh, consists actually on, um, uh, let's see how this works, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, will, I will leave it. So the, it, it consists of, of, of three actually pillars that, that relate to the greenhouse gas emissions. So the first one is the emission trading system, which deals with uh, uh, emissions of the, of the large, largest emitters from the energy intensive industry and the power sector. Uh, which covers EU-wide about 37% uh, of emissions in, in, in 2020. In the Netherlands, the, the share of ETS uh, emissions in the total emissions is a bit larger than, than the average uh, EU. It's 45%. So then the other sectors that are not covered by the ETS, uh, they are uh, covered by the uh, effort sharing regulation. Uh, so this is, these are em emissions from the buildings and from the transport uh, sector, from agriculture, and also uh, part of the industry. So the small, uh, small companies within the industry. And actually, this is not a, a policy instrument like the emission trading system, but this is a, a, a regulation that sets the uh, binding national targets for the, for the member states. 
uh, on, on an individual level. And uh, member states have to implement policies themselves uh, in order to achieve uh, the, these, these emission reductions that they have to, uh, uh, well, that, that are given by this binding target. And then there's also part of the emission of the uh, regulation that, that uh, covers another part of the emissions, which is the land use and land use change uh, uh, and forestry regulations, which deals with uh, emissions, also sinks uh, of, of, of emissions, carbon emissions by uh, land use. And then there are also uh, two directives that are relate not to emissions, but are indirectly related to greenhouse gas emissions by uh, focusing on energy, which is the Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive. So the Fit for 55 package is a, a package of proposals that was, uh, was laid on the table by the European Commission in uh, last summer in, uh, with, with several proposals that are meant to deliver the targets of the European Green Deal, which, which states, which is also laid down in a, in a European climate law. So there should be a net reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions of at least 55% in 2030. And on the long term, in 2050, uh, there should be uh, climate neutrality, so no net emissions of greenhouse gas emissions. So the Fit for 55 package consists of, of several elements. Uh, well, an important uh, part of, of, of this package relates to pricing emissions. So we already have the emission trading system putting a price on emissions from these the sectors covered by the ETS. Uh, this will be, uh, the, the ambition of this ETS will be increased. But the Commission also proposes to extend the ETS to uh, the building sector and the road transport by a new, uh, new emission trading system. Then there is also the Energy Taxation Directive, which will be updated, and there will be a carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, that was already mentioned before in the presentations before. So this, these are instruments that are brought forward on, on, on pricing by the Commission. Then there is also a set of targets uh, which are uh, which are increased. So the targets on the effort sharing regulation uh, and, and also the, the land use and land use change uh, emissions, but also the targets for renewable energy and energy efficiency will be uh, will be in increased. So more ambition uh, also on these on these targets. And again, here the member states have to implement national policies in order to achieve these these uh, higher targets. And finally, there are, there are some, some, some rules like standards for emissions and for energy efficiency, uh, rules for, for infrastructure and for uh, the fuels that have to be used in the, uh, the aviation sector and the maritime sector. And finally, then there are some more general support measures uh, providing funds for, for innovation and for, uh, for the uh, modernization of the uh, energy system. And also the social climate fund that is meant to, uh, to compensate low income households for the, for the impacts of the, of the proposals uh, laid down. So let's go quickly now to the implications of this Fit for 55 package for the Dutch industry. And then I will, uh, I will, I will go through the main elements. Uh, 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 there. So let's start with the EU ETS. The stronger EU ETS, uh, the, 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 the figure below shows, uh, well, in, in, in one view, what, what is the implication of the, uh, of the proposal. So where we have now a supply of allowances uh, that's decreasing over time and will uh, reach uh, zero in uh, about 2057, uh, after the, the, the proposal, uh, uh, the, the cap will decrease much faster. And uh, as you can see, it will even decrease uh, uh, zero supply of allowances in uh, 2040, even if it's continued after 2030. Uh, and you also see that uh, the, 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 the difference between this, these two is, is also the, 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 actually the, the amount of emissions that has to be uh, reduced compared to the, to the, cur to the current uh, framework. So that's one thing. So the immediate uh, uh, impact of this uh, decreasing, faster decreasing cap is, uh, is a higher price because of an increasing scarcity. And that's something that we already see on the market. So here you see the, the, the change in the, uh, the, the price of emission allowances. Um, here it is. Uh, you see it's, uh, how, it's, how it's changed after the introduction of the, of the, 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 the plans for the Fit for 55. Uh, they were not actually, but it, it, it became more and more clear what, what would be the, the, the impact of this Fit for 55 package. And you see that the price of allowances is increasing fast from a level of 25 euros per ton uh, uh, one year ago to uh, this week even after uh, 
uh, higher than 75 euros or uh, higher than 70 euros per ton. So, and uh, well, important question now is how will this price develop further over time uh, up till, uh, uh, until 2030? Because this is what is important for the investments, as we also have seen in previous presentations, for the investments that the companies uh, in the industry will have to, uh, to make. So, what will be the impact of this higher price? Uh, well, of course, uh, more investments, but uh, there is reason to believe that in the Netherlands the impact might be different from, 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 uh, from other uh, member states. Because in the Netherlands we already introduced uh, this year, 2021, a national carbon levy uh, for the industry, which came on top of the uh, ETS. Which means that, in particular on the longer term, the industry in the Netherlands, uh, covered by the ETS, already was was anticipating a higher a higher price and uh, as you can see in this figure you see the blue line which represents the the the, the national uh, carbon uh, levy for the industry which is increasing over time starting at a, le a level of 30 euros per ton but it it increases to a level of about 125 euros per ton in uh, in 2030 and this this levy comes on top of ETS, EU ETS price, which means that if the ETS price is below this levy, uh, that there will be an additional levy uh, with, with, the, with the amount of the difference between the levy, uh, the blue line, and the, and the ETS price. Um, so as long as the ETS price is higher than this, than, than this uh, blue line, there will be no impact of, uh, of, of the, the national levy, but if, if the national levy is higher, then actually uh, a higher ETS price will, will, will not have an impact and will also not lead to, to additional reduction. So in addition to this levy, we also have the uh, subsidy on low carbon technologies, the SDE++ mainly, which uh, also depends on the ETS price, which means that with a higher ETS price, the subsidy that companies will receive will become lower. So two other uh, effects that are relevant for the industry uh, of the, the, in, the, in the proposals are uh, uh, reduced, but also a better targeted free allocation of uh, emission allowances. And uh, as I already showed, the innovation fund and the modernization fund, which provide subsidy for, you know, for, for decarbonization, uh, the, the, the budgets uh, will be, will be doubled, in, uh, doubled in the proposals. So in addition to this EU ETS, uh, uh, stronger EU ETS, the Commission also proposes a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which will reduce the risk of carbon leakage by uh, putting a price on the on a carbon price on the imports of uh, goods uh, which come from outside the EU, from countries where there is less, uh, uh, less ambitious climate policy or no, even no climate policies. And this will be introduced in 2026 for iron and steel, aluminum, uh, cement, fertilizer and electricity. Um, then there is uh, also uh, some proposals related to renewable energy and the most important for the, for the Dutch industry is that there is a, a national binding target which says that 50% uh, of the hydrogen that is used in the industry should be uh, actually green hydrogen. And another uh, target relates to the, uh, the use of renewables in heating and cooling, which also includes the industry, uh, which should increase by 1.1% point, uh, 1 .1 point each year. Um, so, but it's not only ETS and, 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 and related emissions which count, but also the effort sharing regulation, because part of the industry is also covered by this, uh, by the effort sharing regulation. As you can see here, it's about 20% uh, of the total industrial emissions are uh, not covered by ETS, but by the effort sharing. And so that means that uh, uh, an increased target for the Netherlands uh, uh, under this effort sharing regulation can also have an impact on the industry. Well, depending on the choices that are made by the Dutch government, uh, which, which of these uh, sectors uh, un under the uh, effort sharing regulation should contribute to this target. For the energy efficiency, actually there are no specific targets for the industry, uh, but of course the industry also has, has to, to contribute to the, uh, or, or might contribute to the, the, the annual uh, en energy savings uh, targets for the, for the Netherlands. And then finally, the uh, energy taxation directive, uh, uh, the proposals that are there uh, are, are laid on the table, might have some, some impact for the, for the industry. In particular, 
uh, because it says that the, 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 there should be equal taxes on energy products for specific use, and that means that there is not, it's not anymore allowed to have different rates for different amounts of use, which we have in the Netherlands. We have now a tiered system uh, for natural gas and for e electricity, which means that uh, the large energy users will pay, uh, on average, a lower uh, taxation rate than, than, the, than, the, than the households. Uh, but this will have to be uh, well uh, abolished then in the Netherlands. Another uh, thing that, that that is relevant, another proposal, is that the national tax rates should replicate the ranking of the minimum rates that were introduced by this tax directive, and in, this this will uh, mean that the uh, the tax rates for fossil fuels like uh, natural gas uh, should be higher than uh, for for electricity. And finally, there is some, some, there are some restrictions uh, put on the exemptions that uh, may be uh, used for the for the for the for the tax uh, for energy taxation, in particular for the natural gas used in uh, combined heat and power installations, and also for some specific uh, processes. So to uh, to conclude, uh, there are some. Uh, well, what are the main implications of the Fit for 55 for the Dutch industry? Well, the direct impact on the industry mainly comes from ETS, a higher price in the, within ETS, uh, but ETS also provides a clear path to zero, maybe even in, in 2040, which means that, well, uh, as Gertjan Lankost uh, indicated, it's relevant for the industry to know what, what is ahead and where we have to, uh, to go for. Well, the ETS gives a, a, a clear path to zero. Well, for the industry, it's also relevant that the, the free allocation will be reduced because, well, because the total amount of allowances will be reduced, so also the share of, of free allocation within this total uh, supply of allowances. But also uh, because, there, because of the introduction of the carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism, which means that this, this will replace, to some extent, the free allocation. And finally, so the 50 uh, the the 50 percent uh, uh, requirement for green hydrogen, uh, well, it, this this has an enormous impact, may have an enormous impact on the uh, the use of hydrogen, as the Netherlands is a high, uh, uh, well, a lot of uh, uses a lot of hydrogen in the industry. The impact on the emission trading uh, on on the other uh, the directives, uh, well, will depend on the on on how the Netherlands, how the Dutch government will implement these uh, regulations. So I will leave it to that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Corian, for your presentation. Um, given the, the time, at, and actually there are uh, see no questions yet in the chat. Um, we will have the break now, and um, if you have any further questions, you can add them in the chat, and we will consider them for a plenary discussion. We will now go to a short break, so please come back at 10 past 4. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good to see you back at, uh, at the Meden conference. Uh, we're here for the final plenary discussion with uh, our speakers. Uh, we have Koyan Brink, um, Gert-Jan Langkorst, uh, Marit van Hout and Hattie Boonman, and Anne Sorel is also still available, uh, but he's not, not at, this, uh, at this location. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of uh, presentations about the, the challenges for the industry, uh, policies, uh, data, and how that can help to transform the industry, and we'd, we'd like to have a bit of further discussion. Um, and I would like to start with Gert-Jan uh, Langkorst. We've seen uh, a lot of uh, ambitious new uh, policy proposals at, at the EU level. Um, what is your general impression of that? And more specifically, there is a target for, for green hydrogen. Is that really going to help to, uh, uh, yeah, to benefit the transition in the Netherlands? Uh, the answer is two times yes. Um, but let me elaborate a little bit on it. I'm very happy with the EU um, package. It's ambitious, um, but it's European. And that is um, a lot better than just a national policy. Um, CO2 problem is a global problem, but um, um, it's, it's certainly better to look at it on a broader scale, especially in the relevant market for most of our industries. Um, so we don't have the competitiveness issues that you have when you when you introduce a national policy. The level playing field in Europe is there, and the CBAM uh, that is included in the package is uh, something that also provides some protection for the international competition. So that is one thing I'm very happy with. It's also a package that is um, 
integral. It, 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 it's comprehensive, uh, thought of all sectors. And um, I think it can not only help the Dutch industry, it can also help in the effort sharing regulation sectors uh, where you see that politicians always find it very difficult to implement measures that are not popular with the voters. Um, well, it's, it's always for a politician easier to say it comes from Brussels, but then we have to. And, and I think it's necessary to do something in all sectors. Um, with regard to the green hydrogen target, um, I understand that the Commission wants to have a real bold, firm target um, that really creates a change in the market. And that's good, but um, this seems to be a bit overambitious to me. Um, you must realize that more than 50% of the hydrogen that is used in industry in Europe is used in the North Sea area, in, in the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Germany, so in the Ara uh, region. So we are hit by this target much more than other countries. And um, uh, if, you, if you make calculations, and I don't have them uh, in my head, but calculations on how much electrification, um, hydro, hydro <laughs> sorry, um, um, electrolysis uh, installations you need um, to, to make such a lot of hydrogen, I think is not possible. Then you, of course, can also import uh, green hydrogen, but we're not the only ones looking at green hydrogen from uh, Mozambique or from Australia or from North Africa or whatever. A lot of countries are looking at those markets. I'm happy that we are really looking at it. Uh, I know the Port of Rotterdam is already uh, um, doing the, the, the studies. How can we, how can we take this uh, hydrogen into our system? But it will be, it will be very hard. So um, maybe 50% um, should be reduced somewhat, or we should make it possible to also do it with um, uh, the blue hydrogen and, uh, and the other options that there are. Mm -hmm. And maybe Aaron Sorel, you've been, been looking at uh, the decarbonization options for the U.S. And is, is there similar attention to hydrogen in the U.S. compared to the Netherlands? Do you see a lot of, uh, is there a comparable situation? Um, well, I guess similar to Europe, there's also a lot of hype around hydrogen in, uh, in, in the U.S. Um, as we also seen some recent studies uh, also about the role of blue hydrogen uh, in the U.S., which were not favorable for blue hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> so the, yes, there is a lot of discussion about it, especially in those regions uh, uh, wh where there's a large concentration of energy demand uh, and also where there's a large uh, gas industry. So think about Texas, uh, but, uh, and also a lot of discussion, of course, in other parts of, of, of the country. Um, <clears throat> but I, what I see there, there's also a lot of interest in electrification. Um, so yeah, it, it really depends on, on what industry you're looking at and, and what location. Uh, I, I would kind of summarize the, the discussion in the US. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe maybe you can move to, uh, to Koi and Brink. You, you gave also a presentation about the EU uh, uh, targets and, and uh, new policy initiatives. And it, it seems to be very ambitious, also changes to the to ETS. A lot more incentives for the industry, and in the Netherlands we have, uh, since recently, uh, a Dutch CO2 tax, which is uh, meant to, to speed up the Dutch transition. Is that really still necessary, given that uh, that you have so many EU initiatives uh, at the moment? Well, I think that the good thing of the, the design of the Dutch national levy is that. Um, it's, it's designed in such a way that uh, it's dependent on the ETS price. So with a high ETS price, the additional levy, as I showed, the additional levy becomes becomes uh, smaller. And even if, well, we don't know what, what will what will go, uh, what will be the ETS price in 2030, but it might be even higher than 125 euros per ton. And then the national levy uh, will be zero, and then we have a, a level playing field for the for the Dutch industry. So I think. Well, that's that's uh, that's uh, it, 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 well. It's moving moving together with the ETS, and uh, well, uh, the, the higher ETS price is a good message then for the Netherlands because then the difference with the, with, the, with with the rest of Europe is uh, becoming smaller. Mm -hmm. 
And you, you're an expert on pricing of, of energy and emissions. Do you, do you see a lot of good uh, initiatives on that in the EU plans? You have, uh, what do you mean? No, the, uh, giving the correct price incentives to companies. Uh, well, I think ETS is doing that, that now already, and that's, I think, the nice thing of the ETS as an instrument. You don't have to wait for all the negotiations between member states and, and European Parliament. Uh, uh, because only the, the, the proposal uh, of, the, of the European Commission uh, had, a, had an effect on the, on the current price. Mm -hmm. So I think, well, that's a, clear that the, 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 the industry in, in, in the EU is, uh, well, uh, seeing this as a very uh, realistic way to go forward and they're preparing for that because they're willing to pay, uh, well, this week 75 euros per ton for, uh, for uh, an, uh, a permit, emission permit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's that's really one of the ways in which uh, yeah, policymakers try to influence the behavior of companies. And that's actually one of the things that Marit has to deal with. You've, you've given a presentation about how to model uh, yeah, the investments of the industry, but it means actually also that you have to, to model the behavior of industry. Um, how do you do that, and what are, what are some main uncertainties there? Well, it's of course... Um quite easy to uh, implement all the economic uh, trade-offs like uh, investment cost, uh, things like uh, that. But it's, it's a lot harder to um, model a company behavior and especially um, when it's based on imperfect information. Uh, you don't know beforehand how uh, companies, for example, uh, will uh, respond. Um, also, with regard to the whole setup of the CO2 uh, levy and the exchanges of the, the dispensation uh, rights, if one company has a surplus, uh, will it trade it with another company and to what cost? Uh, that, will, that whole system needs to be set up by the industry uh, itself. And how that will evolve, um, yeah, we don't know for sure, of course, but we have to make assumptions on that also for CAF. Um, so that is, that's always yeah, a, a, a challenge and it should be part of uh, the, the uncertainties. That's why uh, the uncertainties also within CAF are uh, very uh, important because uh, this is the place and the location uh, where to implement all the things that you are not certain about and are of relevance uh, for modeling the industry should be implemented. Do you, see, do you see that a lot more information has become available recently on, uh, on the plans of the industry and, and what, they, what they actually would like to do? Uh, well, MIDA was very uh, helpful, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> and um, I think the whole discussion around uh, the industry and also uh, opening up uh, to the rest of the Netherlands, uh, that uh, yeah, ha has improved quite a lot. I think, indeed, uh, trust is an important uh, component. Uh, that we are moving in all the same direction and we should help each other in uh, yeah, making the steps uh, forward um, and also understand why we need certain data and uh, uh, yeah, what, it, what is the way uh, forward. So I think it definitely has improved over the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. And um, I think um, uh, if you see the attitude of, of, of a lot of companies, then when we started with the climate agreement four years ago, um, there was a lot of hesitance to show what possibilities companies would have because the idea was when I, when I tell that it's possible for me to implement this or that, it will be uh, obliged to do so. And, and um, what, what companies, I think, have learned is that it's better to be clear on what you can do, uh, but also to make clear what is necessary to make it possible. And um, if I now look at the whole process of making the cluster energy strategies and, and, and this national framework um, that, that's derived from it, the MEEK, um, I think that that is only possible because companies have seen that it's also important for themselves to be open about uh, their options, to be open about um, what bottlenecks there are, and uh, together to find out how you can um, work on a strategy that not only includes what the industry must do, but also what other, co other sectors must do, what the government must do. And well, I, I repeat myself, but especially what the infrastructure companies must do to make it possible that all that energy is transported from one location to another. 
If I can ask, what is the main reason that uh, they decide to open up? Because they also give up information that they might also like to keep a secret for, to themselves. The, I think the reason is that um, maybe in the past you could say, well, if I do this investment and my competitor doesn't know about mm -hmm. it, I have a competitive advantage. Yeah. But these are investments that you need to do to comply with either uh, climate targets or regulation that that's comes with it. And um, um, it is too big for one company to do that all by yourself. So you, you immediately business. realize that you have to cooperate with others. Yeah. And, and I think that insight has grown over the past years. Yeah. And the Midden project is one of the uh, means that helps in this respect. Yeah. If you see the reports of other industries, of other branches, then it can inspire you to say, well, maybe this, is, this would be beneficial for our sector as, as well. Yeah, I agree. Maybe you can go, go back to the presentation of Hattie because you've been looking at, uh, at the competitiveness of the Dutch industry. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you mentioned was this, this new initiative for a border tax or the government border adjustment mechanism. Mm -hmm. Did you get some insights on, on what the effect could be and, and how necessary that is to, uh, to well, let the, the industry remain competitive? Yes. Well, we haven't analyzed the effect of a uh, carbon border tax quite yet, but um, also the work that we've been doing was preliminary, so we're in the middle of it, or well, in the middle, not exactly, but nearing the end. Uh, but the conclusions that we can draw already based on the analysis that we have done is that a carbon border tax seems almost uh, unavoidable because we found that there are such negative effects on the profit without a carbon border tax. Basically, we're living it well, we're in a global world. The Netherlands can't do it alone. We have to do it together with the world. But currently, it's mostly the EU that has this ETS, uh, ETS framework. There are a couple of other regions out of my mind. I believe it's New Zealand, California, and I thought Japan, I'm not sure, that are also having this um, ETS price or this, uh, this cap system. So if, if we're doing it too much on our own, then those companies, they will probably, they will leave Europe. And the question is whether that's, that's something that we need. So if we raise the carbon border tax, that might, well, that might protect those companies in Europe a little bit more. Because it's also not acceptable that if those companies, they go abroad or to other continents, then we'll have to import all the materials uh, that before were still inside Europe. So we're not better off in that in that sense as well. Um, so that's one of the re well, that's one of the main reasons why we think that the carbon border tax is unavoidable, and that uh, we should definitely take a look at it. But how high it should be, that should still be uh, should still be analyzed. Well, there are quite some 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 difficulties there because. Uh, well, uh, it's it's only covering the import, not the exporting uh, companies, mm -hmm. uh, because that's that seems to be very difficult with the World Trade Organization uh, rules uh, there are. Uh, but also how to deal with countries which have climate policies but not an explicit uh, carbon price, like mm -hmm. uh, like in the U.S. It seems that that the Biden administration will have some difficulties in introducing a carbon price, but probably they will have some quite some regulation. So. How has the EU to deal with that? So that's that's I think something that's uh, well will will become more clear in the in the coming years. But that's something that uh, well makes this this carbon border adjustment mechanism important, but also very difficult to uh, to implement. Yeah, also, and if you think about it, the alternative would be if there would not be a carbon border tax or just a low one, then we've seen that the chemical companies they cannot do it on their own in Europe. So there will be either a lot of sub then there will be a lot of subsidies to keep them inside. And the question is, is this a sustainable situation where we keep on subsidizing our companies to keep them inside Europe? Because that, in a way, is also tax money, uh, well, based on taxation. So there should be, at some point, a good business model, right? That's good for the companies, that, such that they want to stay inside Europe. But actually, we hope that at some time other countries will also decarbonize. Exactly. And a good point, because it's a transition phase. Right now, like right now, we're in a let's call it an equilibrium where 
they are financially healthy, as we saw, and would like to go to another equilibrium where, again, they're financially healthy, but this transition phase is such uncertain and not everyone is moving at the same time. So we should make it as comfortable as possible, but still it should remain, the government support should be in the transition phase and not a permanent um, yeah. thing, right? Well, let, let's ask Ernst <laughs> Forel. Do, do you see that there is a big risk and uh, and that we stay too long in a phase where a lot of government support is needed for uh, for industrial uh, transformation? Well, I, I think it would be a bad move to subsidize. Uh, uh, you think? Because I mean, I I think what I well, I want to try to say is that that this is something that will happen all over the world. So we're actually we're talking about a transition phase right now, um, but within a few years, all those other countries will. Either I mean follow, but I mean the word follow may be the wrong thing because I think uh, a lot of countries are moving ahead, uh, independent of uh, carbon border adjustment taxes. I mean, you just look at like how now how I mean uh, how quickly things can change. You can see in the steel industry. Uh, I mean now with, with uh, SSAB, the Swedish steel maker, part of hybrid. Uh, actually, they were offered uh, Tata and they had no interest in it. And whereas Tata ten years ago was one of the, the jewels of the global steel industry. And so we, uh, we really need to, to realize that this change is going to happen everywhere and we need to be there quickly. Uh, instead of trying to protect the status quo, we need to move quickly. And, and, uh, and yeah, another example, of course, is, uh, is, is automotive transportation, where we see China uh, moving extremely rapidly and becoming now basically a, a leader in this industry. Uh, and the German car makers uh, kind of, uh, well, except Volkswagen, who tries to, to release to, to to, to pick up the game, uh, we, we see them lagging behind. And, and so we need to, to also see this as an opportunity and not just as a risk. And yes, the Netherlands has a kind of a strange, uh, we have a very strange industrial structure, uh, which is very energy intensive, uh, which is partially driven, of course, by our location but, and partially driven by history and the historic choices that we have made uh, based on, for instance, on the, cheap availability, the, the, the assumed uh, internal availability of natural gas. Um, so we need to, um, yeah, I think it's also in our interest to really think through strategically about these opportunities and, and not start to, to uh, just think about short term um, issues like uh, uh, we, we need to, to protect the industries that are transforming and transitioning, uh, but those that are not willing to transform, there's, there's no place for them in any future world, neither here nor somewhere else. And, and I think that we need, the industry needs to realize that, uh, but also the policymakers need to realize that. And, and so we need to figure out what's the, what is then the strategic or, or the, you know, the way to get there, what's the strategy to get there uh, and, um, yeah, and, and be open about that and realize that things are going to change. And I mean, we don't like change, but things are going to change dramatically within the next decades, just for our own survival as, as human species. I mean, the world will be better without us, but uh, if we want to survive, then uh, the world will survive. Uh, but uh, if we want to survive as a species and not deal with all the challenges that climate change will offer, I mean, yeah, we, we cannot even deal now with one million refugees from, from Syria or Iraq, let alone what will happen with climate change. Uh, so <clears throat> we need to change and we need to understand that, uh, that urgency. Uh, and, and, and that takes a whole, that's where you need a whole different um, yeah, few on on how to to run this transformation and yeah, yep. not go back into the, the traditional reactions. I think that's a very nice message to wrap up with, and uh, yeah, there's still a lot of challenges. So thanks to all the speakers of today, um, Koyan, uh, Gertjan, Marit, and Hattie, and we'll go back to Silvana. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have unfortunately arrived to the end of the program of today. Um, with a minute, uh, a couple of minutes later, apologies for that. But um, I'd like to thank the speakers, um, the organizers as well of the meeting com conference, and as well uh, the partners uh, and, and everyone that contributed to the meeting project. Um, as I mentioned, the materials and, and the recording will be available at the meeting site, meetingweb.nl. Thank you very much for participating today. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>